in the long run, passivity won't pay off. It never pays off. If you want a life of meaning and transcendence, you're going to have to move. Aggression doesn't have to be toxic or damaging. Healthy aggression risks. It builds new things. It breaks through barriers. It's the key to living a life that matters. I'm Brian Tome, and this is The Aggressive Life. Fighting. Everything in your life is a fight. It might not surprise you to know that uh, I am not a pacifist. I am not a pacifist. Uh, I also don't get offended or bothered by all the violent acts that are in the Bible. Uh, Those violent acts certainly are challenges to many people's faith. Those violent acts certainly need to be examined and talked about. I'm not trying to say, hey, we shouldn't be thinking about them or talking about them. No, they're big, big deals for a lot of people. But personally, violence has always been something that's happened in our world, always. It's just part of life. I don't like that violence is in life, but it is just a part of life. And so many things in the physical realm mirror those things that are in the spiritual realm. When you're in a physical fight, it is all consuming and everything that is before you is the only thing that matters. You just get tunnel vision for that thing. That is the same thing with the spiritual realm. All of us are in a spiritual fight. All of us have something that's trying to smack us down, a failure we can't get over, an addiction that's kicking our rear end, a fear that we can't get over to get to the next level, the inability to make a commitment to another human being. I could go on and on and on and on and on. These are all emotional, spiritual, intellectual in nature, but make no mistake about it, it is a fight. And if you want to explain away fighting or the reason why fighting shouldn't exist, you're going to explain away how your life is going to work. You're going to have to get the attitude of being a fighter, taking things personal, getting in the ring with them. I don't care if you're man, I don't care if you're a woman, I don't care if you're 15, I don't care if you're 85. Fighting is a part of life. And today I'm going to be interacting with a classic fighter. I'm going to be interacting with Michael Chandler. Michael Chandler is from the land of badassery. Yes, he's a badass three-time Bellator lightweight champion. He's got an incredibly impressive MMA record of 20 wins and five losses, eight of those wins by knockout, seven by submission. Sportingnews.com has voted him the number one greatest fighter in Bellator history. We're meeting him here today in Nashville, Tennessee, just days after another victory, a first-round knockout in front of a packed super arena in Japan. Mike, Michael's aggression, both in and outside the ring, have propelled him to incredible heights. I'm so excited to say, hey, Michael Chandler, welcome to The Aggressive Life. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Man, it's a, it's an honor. Now, let, let's just start off here. I'm going to need you to educate me. I'm a true confession because people are going to really judge me who are part of The Aggressive Life podcast. They're going to say to me, how can you be hosting The Aggressive Life podcast and have a confession you have right now? Here's my confession. I have never watched a full MMA fight. Right. I know. I never, I'm going to tell you why. And then I want you to walk me through it. I got no problem with violence. Sometimes violence is the answer. Mm -hmm. Um, I boxed a bit in high school, uh, at a a gym that I went to, but man, when my first time I turned on MMA years ago, it just freaked me out, man. Got a guy on all fours with another guy, giving him uppercuts to the face. Mm -hmm. It's like, man, I don't, I don't like it. So I, I, I can't handle though. When I see Little snippets, like I saw a snippet of your most recent fight. I can I can take it like in fifteen second snippets, but it's like it's tough. So walk me through like the the science, the sport, the mindset of MMA. Why it's a good thing? You know, I think the sport of mixed martial arts has evolved over the last couple of decades. You know, the the UFC just um, 
just celebrated their 25th anniversary. The UFC started in 1993, and it was truly um, trying to bring guys. It was just guys at, at the time, bring guys together of all ba- different backgrounds, different disciplines, sumo wrestler versus karate guy, karate guy versus jujitsu guy, jujitsu guy versus boxing guy. And we really just wanted to find out who is the toughest, who is the toughest man or man or woman, and who, who what is the toughest or best background, if you will. So obviously with that, there was no weight classes. There also was very little. There was rule. no weight classes? There was no weight classes. So you can go back to some some of the UFC fights back in 1993, and I forget the names, but you will see this very, very large sumo wrestler fighting a guy who's like 170 pounds. Really? So 400-something pound man versus 170 pound man. These days, obviously, it's much different. I mean, back then, you used to be able to do, you know, punch below the belt. You used to be able to really? pretty much everything besides bite and eye gouge. You could not bite or eye gouge back in the day, but everything else was legal. So now there's a lot more rules. You can't do any small joint manipulation. I can't just grab one finger and rip it sideways. That's what's called small joint manipulation. <laughs> well, that's like street fighting. That's what you, you learn in like, you know, self-defense school. If you're, you know, getting attacked on the street, that's what you, that's what you can do there. But inside the confines of our sport, there are a lot of rules. There is a rule set that you have to follow. Um, it, it, we are governed by boxing commissions. I get a, a blood test, a neurological exam, an eye exam, a drug test before every before and after every single fight. You see a lot more college-educated guys. I, I fight because I was called to do this. I, I knew there was a calling on my life that God was pushing me in this direction. I could have went. I got a college degree from University of Missouri. I was an all-American wrestler there. I could have went into the workforce, but something was pulling me towards this sport. And you see a lot, a lot of guys like myself who chose mixed martial arts because we wanted to do it or we had a calling on our life, not because we had this to do it. This is fascinating to me. See, yeah. this, this is why I love this podcast. The people say stuff that I would never anticipated. Mm-hmm. I've never Talk, been, I had never been in a street fight before in my entire never life. Never been never in a street fight. Anybody. Well, in the confines of a wrestling wrestling matches or wrestling room, things got heated. But if it ever came down, I had never been in a street fight. The idea of, of me ever getting a pink slip in school or getting in trouble or getting suspended or getting arrested or any of that, that was my biggest fear in life. I had never been in a street fight in my entire life. Now, here I am 25 fights deep, 10 thousands of hours of sparring and fighting people inside the gym. And uh, I truly believe God put me in this sport for a reason. Well, that's the amazing thing for me with MMA. What I've, what I've always respected about it is as a boxing fan, going way, way back when as a little kid watching Muhammad Ali and Leon Spinks fight in sixth grade, yep. I knew then there's some dude someplace on the planet where he to meet up with that guy in a bar, Muhammad Ali would lose. You know, when I see MMA, though, I'm going, uh, no, you're talking about the baddest dudes who can physically get it done. And you're saying calling of God in a sport that's violent. Walk me through that. I love it. And, and, and the beautiful thing is I've, I've spoken at numerous churches and, and there are numerous. And I think this is what we need. We, we need more. We need more Christian leaders who are OK with confrontation, who are OK and, and, and realize that 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 this world was built upon two opposing forces, whether it be you're on that side and I'm on this side, whether it be a sporting sporting event or whether it be we just disagree, we have to find ways to come together. And sometimes that is through, um, you know, butting heads. And, and for me, I've never been, I've never looked at this sport like it was me inflicting harm on another, on another man. Now, when I go back and I watch my highlights, obviously by default, I'm, you know, hurting other guys inside the cage. But I, but when I look at it, it's, yeah, it's, it's just, to me, it's just a sport to me, getting in a, a, getting in a fist fight in front of millions of people being my calling is no different than me hitting a baseball out of Wrigley field or me, you know, me running a ball for the Tennessee Titans. It's, it's this, it's a sport. It was created here on earth. And there are so many men, especially men, but there are so many people that are inspired by what we do that you can't help but to realize that there's a, that there's a, that there's a, the spirit of God throughout this entire sport because it's something that our people are drawn to whether they are absolutely against it there's still a a an inkling of being drawn to it they're they're interested in it they're 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 curious about it or you have your on the other end of the spectrum extremely devout fans who love the sport and they think it's the greatest sport on earth so there's no way to deny the fact that that, that the spirit of God is throughout this entire sport of mixed martial arts, then you have guys like myself who are, who are Christians who, 
you know, you say they say, well, you know, how how do you, how can you be a Christian and and fight? You ever heard and turn, not the, turn other the other cheek? cheek? Yeah, yeah. happened that. Uh, yeah, exactly. But you know, I think so many things can be you know mis misconstrued, and misinterpreted. Have the to that one. I, I would love to hear that. And I think that's obviously something yeah. to to talk about. It's you a know? very it's it's uh, that that verse. Jesus is not talking about if someone physically punches you on the cheek. He mm -hmm. says very clearly, if somebody hits you on the right cheek. If someone hits you on the right cheek, they're right-handed, they they're not gonna hit you on the right cheek, they're gonna hit you on your left cheek. He's talking about a backhand. Mm -hmm. He's talking about an insult. Mm -hmm. He's talking about when you were insulted. He's not saying when you are accosted, allow someone to kick you in the balls. Yeah. He's not saying that. He's saying when you're insulted, your identity is in Jesus. Your identity is in God's approval of you, not in this other person's approval of you. So. If you want to be a pacifist, that's okay. You're just gonna to have to look for a different Bible verse. Yeah, and and that is fine. And and that's the thing too is is as I've said, the, the funny thing about it is is I feel and you know my wife will tell you this. Like one of the one of the the ways that I was I grew up was I either saw my you know I either saw fighting in my household or extreme walking away and not talking about it at all and whatnot. So we never learned about conflict resolution. But I so I always erred on the side of. Being a pacifist, I always erred on the side of avoiding confrontation with my wife or avoiding confrontation with with other people. I'm not a very confrontational type of guy. I don't like fighting. It doesn't make me feel good outside the confines of competition. But you put me inside a competition, I'm willing to die inside that cage. And I and I think that's why I know for a fact that I was designed for this because I'm. I feel like when it comes to the competitive nature and a guy who's willing to go out there and bite down on his mouthpiece and get into a fist fight and fight with reckless abandon i'm there on the on the end of the on that end of the spectrum but also in life you're going to see me loving my wife and loving my son and loving my people and loving and trying to be an inspirational upstanding citizen and i'm on both ends of the spectrum and i think that's why i've been able to build such a great platform and been able to be able to use my voice and be able to be a guy who really goes out and, and breaks the mold, breaks the stigma of yeah. what a mixed martial artist is, you know? For for our listeners who have never boxed or never been in a street fight or never wrestled, it has always surprised me when I've been in any of those disciplines or those events that <laughs> the, the tiredness yeah. comes so fast. Like, so fast. What, what, what says... What, ha what Hollywood says fights look like, it doesn't look that way. What Hollywood says marriage looks like, it doesn't look that way. What Hollywood says success looks like, it doesn't look... When Hollywood shows these fight scenes that go forever and a guy gets done fighting in one room, goes to the next one, it wears you out. Why, why is it that three minutes in a ring is virtually more exhausting than anything else you could do for three minutes? What's going on there? Yeah, it's why Mike Tyson made the made the phrase famous. Everybody's got a game plan until you get punched in the mouth. You know, I mean, there's everybody. You know, everybody got a plan to get hit. That's actually what he said. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, so you could walk into a boardroom with a game plan, and all of a sudden it goes wrong. But you're not physically in danger. You know, you could walk onto a, a soccer field and or a soccer field or even a football field, and the schemes aren't right and things aren't going. The first quarter didn't go the way you you thought it was going to. But you're really not physically in danger. Mm -hmm. Locked into a cage in front of millions of eyeballs with not to mention months and months of, of practice, tens of thousands of dollars that you spent on your training camp um, with all of this pressure and all, all of, the, all of the, the pressure mounting. I mean, and obviously there's different levels. I mean, the lower level fighting, the lower level smaller shows, these, these guys are going in there with not a ton invested. But I mean, when you think about the money I've invested, the time away from my family, I spent nine weeks away from my family essentially for this last fight. My wife was a single mother. I made a promise to her on the day that the day that I, you know, that we got engaged, that I asked her to marry me, that I would I would take care of her and love her and and cherish her and and provide for her. Yet now I have to be away from her for nine weeks at a time. And the same thing with my son. We adopted him, and I made I looked into his little eyes. He didn't understand what I was saying, but I promised him I was going to take care of him and and love him and be there for him. Yet now I have to be away from them, and you know, so, so there's not so just much. The, the force or the energy of throwing oh, a punch man. or a kick. It's the amplification of I am in danger. Is that yeah. We, uh, well, yeah, I mean, well, and that's and that's really what it is. And and the older I've gotten, the longer I've been in the sport. Whenever you, most of the time, when you see a professional fighter extremely tired in the third round or fifth round, it's not a, it's not because of the lack of physical preparedness. It was lack of control of their mind, their thoughts, their heart rate, their nervous system, and all that kind of stuff. Being able to being able to be in a fight 
and being a being a bad being in a bad scenario, bad situation, a bad position. Keep controlling your heart rate, controlling your thoughts, not letting those negative thoughts come in, and and controlling the narrative inside of your body is much more important than your actual physical preparedness. We're all in shape. We're all able to um, we're all able to withstand twenty five minutes in the cage, and it, and it and with that, that's a, a a metaphor for life. How prepared are you physically? Fascinating. Are, well, how, how par- prepared are you emotionally, mentally, and spiritually to be able to? How much of that do you have in the bank so you can pull out and debit it whenever the bad things happen? Whenever life throws you a curveball, whenever you do get knocked down, whenever you do get put in a bad situation, that could be your detriment. How are you? How are you able to? Look at your North Star. How are you able to think the positive thoughts and know exactly who you are in that moment? Because the physical preparedness is there, but I it's more a, mental. Uh, special that's coming out on Amazon Prime January 26th. I'm not sure when this is airing. And I took um, I took new riders, motorcycle riders, or newer motorcycle riders, on an off-road adventure from the bottom of Colorado up into Wyoming, nice. camped, all that kind of stuff. And man, it was freaking brutal, man. New guys who didn't know how to ride <clears throat> and ladies on rocks and on sand, the wrecks. I mean, we, we were, we lost a person a day for the first four or five days. People just dropping out one person I kicked off. It was, it was pretty intense. We were, we had a, a event recently where we were just watching the, a recap video and talking about it. <laughs> and, uh, and one of the guys looked at his Fitbit and goes, my, my pulse is pegging at 108 right now. And I'm just sitting here. It's the mental. So you're saying the mental thing is what wears you down in the ring as much as the physical. So much more, so much more. And even, and even thinking about that, that's, that's a metaphor for right there. So, so that young man who looked at his Fitbit, he, he, the fear of the unknown and the fear of, of what is about to come because the fear of not being prepared for it. So, so how in your life can you throw yourself into the fire and find peace inside of that battle. How 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 can you build yourself up mentally, emotionally, and spiritually so that whenever that time does come, your heart rate is as cool as a cucumber. You know, you're you're as cool as the other side of the pillow rather than having that fear of of failure. And and that is the hardest part. I mean, shoot, I mean, I just walked out in, in front of 30,000 people and and lights and explosions and all kinds of cool stuff, you know? And then you have to control that heart rate because everybody said, man, this is the biggest arena of your life. This is an awesome opportunity. How awesome is it to be able to fight here? And I fought, I fought at Madison Square Garden. You talked about Muhammad Ali. I, I warmed up in the same locker room as Muhammad Ali. I fought with him. Jealous. Yeah, I fought the same locker room as Mike Tyson, Evander Holyfield. When you talk about fighting history, I fought at at the Mecca here in the United States, Madison Square Garden. So everybody said, how was it? And unfortunately, fortunately, it was awesome. But unfortunately, I wasn't able to truly enjoy it because if I thought about the fact that Mike, Twi- Mike Tyson, you know, sweat right there and he, he put his fight shorts on right there, if I thought about fighting within 10 feet of where Muhammad Ali fought Joe Frazier or whatnot— my heart rate's going to go through the roof. The, the the spectacle of how big this opportunity is can almost get bigger than so you literally, the task at hand. You literally yes. can't jack yourself up. You don't want to jack yourself no, up. No, and that's then. and that's what a lot of people say. They say, "Do you want to go out? Do you just want to kill him? Do you have to? Do you have to say that he, you know, punched your mom or you know tried to hurt your wife?" And I'm like, "No, I actually have no animosity towards the man in front of me. He's he's a man who is who is my weight. He's got two arms and he's got two legs, and he is the, he is the task at hand, just like wrestling was, just like." You know, just like whenever a, a running back hits hits a hole, he's not thinking about is that Ray that's Lewis? A challenge or is that, right before you. Yeah. That's all it is. It's not personal. Yeah, exactly. And 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 I think that's what's beautiful about it. Now, granted, there are some men in this sport and women in this sport who who grew up in different ways than I did. And they, they need to yeah, they need to they need to hype themselves up and say, Man, this guy, you know, slapped my mom and I'm gonna go make him pay for it. And that's that's just not me. And you know, I think there's a, there's a place for that, and there's a place for the the big time pacifists in the sport, and there's a there's a this sport takes all kinds of people, and that's what I love about it, and it's a metaphor for life because life is a fight, business is a fight, marriage is a fight, parenting is a fight, every single thing we do is a fight, whether you look at it as a fight or not, and that's why that's why this sport is is so appealing to so many, and that's why 
I know I'm doing exactly what I was called to do, and that's why I know that there is a, there is such a place for for the Christian man and woman in this sport. Dude, you're dropping so many truth bombs here. I'm like writing them down because I want to come back to them. I got I got my plan. I'm supposed to be operating here, <laughs> sorry. but you keep it. Oh, sorry. We'll yeah. Yeah, how dare you keep we'll saying intriguing in things? You're you keep right, saying you know, it. I'm sorry. I, I need the boring guests that only say the predictable these, things. But these are the things, and 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 I think and here is my my favorite quote of all time, and I forget who says. I think it was Steve Brown. Steve Brown, a pastor. Does that sound familiar? Hi, Half of this stuff I'm I haven't Steve said. Steve Brown <laughs> yeah. with a deep voice <laughs> and, on Key Life today. Is, is that really who it is? That is well, if you said Steve Brown, that's him. He's he a talks pastor. like that. Yeah, he's. A I believe. I believe what I was about to say was something he said, but my mentor said he said it. Anyways, the goal in life is to live your life with so much joy and zeal that uptight Christians question your salvation. And that is <laughs> oh, that is the greatest. That's the greatest of us all. Because oh, whenever is that your when, original line? No, it's not. That's that was the quote that I heard. But I would love to, I would love to tweak it and, and make it wow. my own. But but I think that is the thing, and and that's why I love when when I walk into a church and you can tell seventy percent of them are like, heck yeah, man, this is great. I love what this guy's doing. He you know he looks the part. He fights and he's cool. He's kind of like what a lot of men want to be. But then there's the other ones who are like. Yeah, but you shouldn't be punching people. You shouldn't be look. He's bleeding. You shouldn't do that. You hit him again after you after he was almost knocked out. And I said, yeah, but I'm living my life with so much joy that it's my it's my goal, it's my honor, it's my opportunity to to live my life with so much joy that people like you are questioning my salvation because that means the ones that need to hear this are going to hear it. You're reaching a kind of person that I will never reach. I would love to. I'd love to have the podcast, but you you have natural relationships. You're in environments yeah. that they're not going to be in my environments. They're yeah. they're not going to be in a deer stand. Mm-hmm. They're not going to be in my church. They're not going to be in a motorcycle. You're you're where God wants you to be. That is powerful. I, I, I tell you, one of the things with Christians do that, that quote again. I'm I'm just going to read it. Whoever said it, we're just going to make it our own. Mm-hmm. I want uptight Christians to question my salvation. Damn, that's good. Mm-hmm. Um, because you're living your life with so much zeal, so much joy, right. you know. Because, because truthfully, that's that's the problem with Christianity, right? Yeah. People people are afraid to come to Christianity because they feel like they got to put so many limits on themselves. Completely. I'm not going to be happy. I'm not going to have fun. I'm not going to be joyful. I'm not going to be able to do a, a lot of the things that I want to do. But man, I'm living I'm living my best life. I in, can't as be a me. Yeah. No, you can't be me. Now, there's parts of you and I that are racked with sin, and God's going to root out. But He made you who you are. Of Absolutely. course, you could still be you. And we're putting too many people in a box saying you can't like that sport or you can't do this or you can't do that. And I get hit all the time with, well, you know, well, you're you're causing people to stumble. I'm like, I'm I'm sorry that if I've got a more wide open life, I'm making you stumble. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Your narrowness does not make me responsible for your lack of joy and your ability to stumble. Sorry. Yeah, and that's, think, that's on you. That's not on me. And I think you encompass that 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 idea of living your life with you living your life with some sometimes with reckless abandon, being a little bit dangerous. I don't want people to come away from an in, inner interaction with me and say, man, he is just such a great, nice Christian man. He's, he's just nice. this. No, I want I want people to look at me and say, man, that that dude right there, he's a little dangerous. I don't know what yeah. he's gonna say. He might cuss a little bit. I don't know. He might say something that might make me feel a little bit weird, like Christians aren't supposed to say that. He might, you know, he might, he might do things, or he might be, he might be in a in a training session, and I might look at him and say, "Man, I don't think a Christian was supposed to react that way." But man, I'm a sinner just like everybody else, and I'm just a man trying to make it in this world, you know. And and I think that's my goal. I, w- I want to be looked at a little bit da- more dangerous, well, you're a like dangerous a, Christian. You're like man. a Peter. Yeah, exactly. I mean, Peter. I'm talking about the Apostle Peter. Christians are always like down on Peter because of all of his stupid mistakes. Mm -hmm. But what they miss is his stupid mistakes always come on the backside of aggression. And Jesus was in love with his aggression. That's why it was one of his favorite. Love it. Peter says, Peter, Jesus says, Who do people say I am? And all the other apostles goes, Well, some people say this, and some people say there's a bunch of weenie boys don't want to speak for themselves. Jesus says, I say the Messiah. Boom. Let's go. Jesus is out in the water, and Peter says, hey, if it's you, ask me to come and come to you. He says, okay, come out and walk. Jesus, Peter comes out, he walks in the water, he notices wind and waves, he starts to sink, and Christians go, ah, oh, there's Peter just looking at wind and waves and sinking, what an idiot. Hey, man, he's the only one who got out of the boat. Mm-hmm. He's the only one. He, Jesus is getting arrested, and Peter pulls out a sword and whacks the guy's ears off. Now, this is not a pocket knife, it's a sword. Jesus would have seen him with that sword before this happened. And Jesus makes no statement about him having an object of violence in his possession, Mm -hmm. none. He whacks off the guy's ear and 
Jesus goes, eh, you know, wrong action at the wrong time, basically what he says, puts the guy's ear back in his head. But he's not like down on the idea of you protecting me. Mm-hmm. Peter's the only one. Where's all the other guys? Are you kidding me? I mean, I would hope if someone was going to unjustly take one of my friends, I would get in the way. Mm-hmm. Peter's the only one who does. Peter then denies Jesus three times. People go, oh, oh Peter, he just, you know, he's denying him. Through, oh, what is wrong? What is problems? You know? Hey, again, he's the only one who's there. All the rest of them ran away. He was there. I think he's wondering if he should could be able to rescue him, protect him, or something like that. And at the end of his life, Jesus dies. He gets resurrected, and Peter hears from women that the tomb is empty, and Peter is the one who runs the tomb. He runs. Now, you think about this. The last time Peter had seen any had seen Jesus, he had denied him. He runs the tomb. You wonder, like, is he running the tomb because he knows he's going to get forgiven? Is he running the tomb because he knows Jesus is a person of grace? I don't know, but that's his freaking deal. Yeah. That That is the standard for what we should be like, not a philosopher who has just a, who has a problem with what other people do with their life. Mm-hmm. That's why I, I love how you're pushing us. Goodness gracious. Yeah, well, every single thing you said there was absolutely amazing. So Peter it was, was my dangerous. Podcast, so I appreciate that was good. No, that, but yeah. no, but Peter Peter was dangerous. And and how how great is that 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 Peter's that Peter that if Jesus had his his choice, he was going to take Peter with him because yes. Peter was dangerous. Right. I love that too because you know, we talked a little bit before the podcast about about failure. You know about losing. I mean, yeah, great record, twenty and five. I, I win most of the time, but I've lost five times, and it's hard to lose publicly. It's hard to lose and feel like you've let so many people down. But I. I look at, I liken the, the, the fact that Peter failed by denying Jesus, right? But then he ran back into the tomb. What did he do? He was ready to run back in and own his mistakes, put his hand in the air and say, yep. yes, I failed and I'm ready to go. Yes. You know, and, and that's the hardest part about mixed martial arts is losing a fight, right. looking, looking as if every single person looks at you like a, you know, a loser, because you are a loser. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I'm, seriously, I lose too. I have bad sermons or stuff like that, but yeah. I'm not on my back bleeding mm-hmm. with the whole... That, that's got to be terrifying, yeah. brother. And the, and the MMA media, just like the, the Christian media, kind of will write a little bit of something about it and say, oh, he's fallen off. Hey, you know, because I, I came into this sport fast, hard. You know, I had the opportunity to... I fought a tournament. I fought, th- fought three fights in three months, uh, March, April, May of 2011. Then I fought again in November of 2011. So I fought six fights in a 13-month period to get to the world title and beat a guy named Eddie Alvarez, who was number three in the world at the time. And so I shot like a rocket ship to the top. And then, um, you know, from then on, I've had ups and downs and battled back from losses. But I've, I've, I've since learned to, just like Peter, failed and ran back into the tomb. He admitted his mistakes. I have learned that I've realized that every single person that I've ever looked up to, every single person that you look up to and idolize and and, and want to be like, want to emulate, they have been a failure at one so point or, or another. Coach us, coach us, Michael. If you've uh, when, when you failed mm-hmm. and you had how many losses in a row? Three, three, five, three losses three in a row. row six hundred and eighty-eight days without a win. Uh, okay, so I know we've got listeners. Mm-hmm. who it's been 688 days without a win. Yes, sir. Our marriage has been limping for a long, long time. We've had a failure that everyone knows about that just crushed us. We've we've been losing accounts left and right. We've been in credit card debt because of stupid decisions that we've made. Um, we're, we're, we're at loss because something wiped us out physically because it was in our DNA and we had no, I, oh, no idea it was, it was there. Uh, we've lost our job because we said something stupid. We did. There, there's, there's a lot of people who have lost and are losing right now, mm-hmm. help us. What do we do when we're on our back? You know, I think it's so much of an inside job. The enemy really is the inner me most of the time, you know? Um, and that and that really has been the problem because because you can you we're all gonna have those great days. We're all gonna have those great seasons of life, but without without the without falling down in the valley, without getting kicked in our teeth and falling down and having to pull, pull ourselves back up. There, there is no, um, there is no growth. You know, being able to throw yourself into the battle. So, um, taking ownership for that loss. I think the biggest problem we do we have as as men is is we do have the ego of um, not admitting our faults, not saying sorry when we need to say sorry, not not showing ourselves enough grace. You know, we see so many people fail and we think they failed because it was bad circumstances. Whenever we fail, it's because we're losers, right? That's one of the hardest things that I had to, that I had to overcome. I already came from a a uh, a small a small minded thinking mindset as I grew up that um, that I really had to 
find a way to give myself permission to be the best. You know, we, we all, we find all these reasons why we should lose and find all these reasons why we should fall short and all these reasons why we shouldn't succeed, but give yourself permission to be successful, you know? Um, and the only thing worse than the only thing worse than failing is, is winning and realizing that the winning isn't going to make you happy. You know, the only thing worse than, than bouncing off the bottom after you lose is making it to the top, looking around and realizing that wasn't enough. So the do in your life, what you're going to do, what, what you're going to portray to the world, that, that task, that, that platform of what you have is going to be nothing if you don't know exactly what, what you are, who you are, whose you are, and what you stand for. Um, so really, you know, for me, I hire, I've hired a mental coach. Um, I really have realized that in my sport, or whoever's listened to this in their business, in their in their marriage, um, there are so many things that are created equal. In mixed martial arts, we are all great athletes. We're all in shape. We all punch hard. We all we all we all know how to fight. But it's it's the man who's willing to push harder. Not not the man who's willing to push the hardest, but push the hardest after it gets painful. Mm. That is usually going to be the victor. And whenever, and also the man who believes him in himself after things have gone wrong. So. So making sure you, whether it be joining a mastermind, whether it be joining, hiring a coach, a personal one-on-one coach, whether it be getting into your Bible, whether it be reading, reading the right books, whether it be setting aside the right amount of time every day, every week to, to make sure you're focusing on the mental and the emotional and the spiritual. I, I got one fight I'm going to challenge you with right now. I don't know if you're man enough for, are you ready for, I, oh, I got serious right. Smackdown. Okay, let's go. I lost to Mike Fisher in thumb wrestling. Oh my and gosh. I'm, I'm here to, uh, yes, and I'm here to kick your ass right hockey now. Hockey players don't even have strong thumbs. Oh, how do you do oh, how yeah, are you well, gonna, okay. how are you right right here. I actually right, have a, I actually right, right here right now. Okay, let's go. Come All right, on. let's go. Okay. And then I'm then I'm coming for you, Mike All Fisher. Right. <laughs> here we go. One, two, three, four. I declare a thumb war. Oh, you go with you go with that. Oh technique. no, you can't do that. You can't <laughs> That's oh, a decoy. Come on, why are you staying away? <laughs> That's a decoy. Oh, passive. I don't want to mix it up. Just oh, all right, I'll give you that one. I'll give you that one. Was it was close, close. I'm coming for you, Fisher. <laughs> All right, hey, let's take a break here. Let me tell you, this episode is brought to you by Groove Life. You can get 15% off your next silicone ring or watch band at GrooveLife.com. The promo code is TOME15. Right now, I'm wearing one of these rings. I've been wearing these rings, one of these rings nonstop for a long time. So if you want to try one of these out, they're pretty darn cool and affordable. You can use promo code TOME15, and you can get 15% off. Let's go into the lightning round, okay? This is the lightning okay. round. This is, this is you answer as quickly as possible. And if I want to ask you more, uh, I'll ask you more. But nice, quick answer. Here we go. Best thing to do in a real fight. In a real fight? Like yes. a street fight? Yes. Um, take him to the ground. All right. Why? Good. I, I, I can't even make this a quick round. Why is that? Why is taking the ground? Um, I just think you, there's more control. There's more control whether you want to be, if you're the, if you're in a fight and you want to be offensive, that's, that's a best, the best way to gain a dominant position, um, to, to get control of a situation, whether you want the fight to keep continue happening or just get on top control other than running, interesting. other than running the, the other direction, taking right. the fight to the ground and being on top in a dominant position is the best way to control. Fascinating. Okay. Person in all of history, anywhere in the world, any discipline, anything, person you would most hate to fight. Hmm. Like Genghis Khan to anybody else. Oh man. I, I don't know. I, I mean, I don't ever think about that, I guess. Yeah. All well, right. I guess I'll fight them all. Oh, Bring them on. No, I'm joking. Ass. No, I am. All right. Okay. Superhero. Superhero. You most respect. Batman. Ooh, why Batman. Batman? I don't know. I just, I, I'm not a big Marvel DC comic guy like Avengers. I, I don't watch any of that stuff, but I love the Batmans. And half the reason I like him was I like the Joker as well. So I guess the Joker's not a superhero. He's a villain, I guess. But right. I'm really into the Joker right now. I like the Joker. I think Joaquin Phoenix did a great job in the new one. I think Heath Ledger was the greatest Joker of all time. Rest in peace. Right. Um, but I like, I like, I like the Batman. I like a, the Batman. a bit redundant before, but ties in. Best self-defense move we should learn. You said take him, take him to the ground. How do you do that? Give, give us one move. Yeah, I mean, I think a double leg takedown, similar to a, a football tackle, similar to a, a rugby tackle. Oh. You know, two oh. legs, two legs, head on one, head on one side, two legs, take him down. 
That's self-defense. I mean, if you're, if you're stuck in a, say you're stuck in a, a scenario where someone's coming at you, you know, they're probably not going to throw a knee. So you can put your head down, you can take a, take a shot, and then you can at least get into a grappling exchange where the fight is close and you're going to take less damage. Because if we're out, if we're out here and we're, you know, three feet away, that's where the hardest punch comes because momentum and all that kind of stuff. But when you're in close, you can at least, you know, try to wrestle them to the ground and get in, get into a close combat. Close you're right. That combat. would be shocking. If I, if I think about squaring up on some guy and I'm like you, I'm not anti-violence. I've, done a lot of very physical things, but I personally have never been a in a street fight either. Um, but I think if I am, it's the class thing. Yeah, we're going to be, I'm going to be using my right cross or something like that. Mm -hmm. But somebody charging me and tackling me at the waist, even if we're three feet away, yeah. oh, that would so shock me. Yeah. The or the pull, pull the head down for a headlock. That would be that would be awesome. Pull like the if head I, down for the like if I had if I had to if I if I had to if I had to uh, diffuse a situation. Like say there was just somebody who was coming at my wife or you know like and or coming at anybody anybody one of my friends someone who can't defend themselves pulling someone down in a front headlock and just bouncing their head off the concrete. <laughs> Why are you smiling let, about just bouncing heads know. off concrete? Well, I mean <laughs> we, this is this is under the premise that this person really right. deserves it. But you know there's something called a football a football front headlock. Well, I'll show you later. But like you essentially grab the head like a football just. Like like just like a football player would put it right here in the bread basket, pull them right down in a front headlock, pull them down, snap them down, bounce their head off the concrete. So we're standing and you're doing that. You're not taking me down to the ground first. I'm standing there. No, but I would, I would, yeah, I would go ahead and then. All right, we're gonna we're gonna record that afterwards. We'll do a video. It's, it's, we'll a, post it's it. the best technique of all time. So for you young, you young wrestlers and you young uh, MMA fighters, it's it's the best. I, I I teach it all the time because I think it's the most effective front headlock. All right, so we're gonna take our headsets and off and we're done, yeah. and you're gonna show me that. I think we should leave the headsets on. Oh, you want to do it right now? No, I'm joking. <laughs> okay. All right. Here we go. Next one. Hardest punch you ever took? Um, hardest punch I ever took. I mean, I, I, uh, it's, it's interesting too because I've, I just, you know, two, two fights ago, I got TKO'd because I got hit in the back. You know, when you get hit in the behind the ear, it just takes it out short your circuit. Your wiring, circuit. Yeah. But it wasn't that hard of a punch, man. I've taken some hard punches, man. My second fight against Eddie Alvarez, I took a punch when I was, I was throwing. The, the worst place to be whenever you're in a fight is in the middle of a kick because you're on one foot, you're in a bad position, you're most likely your defense isn't perfect. I was throwing a kick and a right hand came over the top and just hit me right in the nose. One of those ones where when you know when you get hit in the nose and it's just right square and all you see is stars for a second, it's not like a knockout. It doesn't, it doesn't wobble you, but it's just so painful. I took a punch against Eddie Alvarez and it actually like, it actually deviated my septum and made my my septum swell, and I had to get surgery and cut open and drain it. And so I have cauliflower nose and two cauliflower ears. So now did that end that, that fight? That punch? <laughs> no, no, no. It was just I remember it, mm. and you don't remember a lot in these. And like some of these fights, they're so chaotic that you don't remember. Almost like you, like you black out and you're just on autopilot. And that's why you have to train so hard, and why you have to be, have such a strong will and be built up so emotionally, mentally, and spiritually, so that your vessel will carry you through because your brain is your vessel, like, your body, is your vessel, to right your now, body, yeah. your training is not, it is your brain is not going to carry you through. You can't usually can't think your way through a fight. A lot of times when you get into these heated battles, you just have to go on autopilot and just believe that you put the training in and there you go. This is supposed to be lightning round. I'm supposed to be answering quickly, but oh, yeah. I keep asking you to expand because I find your answer. So the answer. Oh. There you go. <laughs> All right. Accomplishment you're most proud of in your whole life. I think my first, it wasn't a world title fight. It was not winning the belt. It was not anything. It was beating Derek Campos after I, after I hadn't won a fight in 688 days. So world titles, I've won three of them. I've fought in eight world title fights, whether I won or lost. None of those hold a candle to the, the victory over myself after that 688 days stretch where I lost, you know, so that's my greatest accomplishment. I remember being at the Scott Trade Center in front of 18,000 people, you know, going and I dropped them and choked them out and I ran, accelerated, jumped up on the cage and I took the biggest sigh of relief I have ever taken in my entire life because finally- The cycle was broken. The, it was broken. Finally, the chains were broken. Finally, the, the weight was lifted and that- it wasn't about Derek Campos. It wasn't about the belts. It wasn't about the money. It wasn't about the lights. It was about me. And I think that's what we are all doing. God put us on this earth and God has given us an unlimited amount of potential. Yet most of us don't 
reach it. We're the only, we are the only organisms on the entire planet that don't reach their full potential. The bee doesn't fly around and, 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 and fall short of pollinating the next plant, right? The, the, bear, the polar bear doesn't somehow forget to hibernate. They don't, they, every single other organization or organi- organism on the entire planet that God has created reaches their full potential mm. aside from the human beings. Mm. And that's, that victory over myself after that 688 day stretch, that was my greatest accomplishment because now I can take that and I can use that and I can move forward with that. And now I've, I've lost since then. I've actually lost two or three times since then, but I've been able to continue to build myself back up. But that was my greatest accomplishment. As I'm hearing what you're talking about in your career, the physical parallels to what you've got to deal with as an MMA fighter are exactly what all of us have to deal with as a spiritual fighter, if we want to be a fighter. A lot of us don't want to be a spiritual fighter. We just want to allow life to happen to us. We want to be victims, and we want to just rationalize all of our decisions. No, man, it's a fight. Mm -hmm. It's a freaking fight. What your life is, is, it's a fight. It is, yeah. Your spiritual life as well as business and marriage and all that kind of stuff. The the failure, getting getting it out of the way and looking at it from 30,000 feet up and realizing that that failure was an event. The failure was not the person. You know, you are not a failure. You are a person who failed, but you are not a failure. And it's only whenever we accept the moniker or accept the label of failure that that doubt and the fears and the insecurities and the the the, sh- the short the future shortcomings decide to take root in themselves or in in you because you thought that you were the failure, but it was just an event that happened, and every right. single person fails. Right. Complete the sentence. I wish people knew that God was a warrior. All right, he I'll fall up. for it. I'll do it again. <laughs> why, why do you say that? I, I just, I mean, I just think, I, I just think he's, I just think he's looked at as, in, and in so many ways he is, he is nurturing, and in so many ways he is loving, in so many ways he is forgiving, and in so many ways, and in so many ways. It, it is this beautiful blanket that cloaks us and we can just be peaceful and we can just, and he, and he brings peace and he brings understanding that passes all knowledge and all of this. But when it comes down to it, when you need to stand up for what you believe in, when you need to fight for anything, when you need to, to stand up for yourself or safeguard the helpless, you can look to God in so many different ways and know that he was a warrior. He has given you a warrior spirit. There is a battle right. out there right. that you are designed to fight. Dude, you, you've brought in just a lot of fresh stuff that I, for one, haven't thought of. I'll just give you one more softball question. I mean, is, is there anything else you want to say the aggressive life that we haven't touched on yet? I think the biggest thing, you know, if we're, if we're you know, obviously I, I am more partial to, to being able to speak to, to men out there because I, I am a man and I know the struggles we go through. I know the ups and the downs of life. And I know that life is a, is a fight, whether you are a fighter or you are um, fighting for your marriage or you're fighting for relationships or you're fighting for your children or you're fighting for your business. Um, constantly realizing that failure is an event, not a person. And that every single person that you have ever looked up to and ever admired has at one point or another been a failure. And if and it was only because they were able to go from failure to failure to setback to setback without losing that momentum, without losing the faith, without losing the steam, and just realizing that, that yes, you lost in, in a public field or in a public realm and people, people saw it and people heard about it, but your losses and how you come back from them say so much more about your loss, say so much more about you than your wins do. And you cannot enjoy the fruits and the spoils of your victories without also accepting that the losses are going to come. And when they do come, you know, I call it putting the shirt back on. The funny thing about my last two fights is I wore a, a Sanford orthopedics sweatshirt, cut off sleeves, cut off neck. I wore it. I lost to Patricio Pitbull back in May. I wore that exact same shirt the next week when I went into a workout and I wore it the week after that in a workout. And I started wearing it in a workout. And then I wore it walking out in this last fight, the biggest fight of, of my career in the Saitama Super Arena in front of 30,000 people. I wore that exact same shirt. Why? And I use that as a metaphor because so many times we want to hide ourselves after a, after a loss. I lost, I, lost my, I lost that first fight to Eddie Alvarez. And then it was nominated for fight of the year. 
Everybody was calling me, hey, come out to this award show. You're up for fight of the year. Uh, Ariel Hawani's calling me. All the, it, it would be like the equivalent of all the biggest names on ESPN, but the MMA media calling me, hey, this is a great fight. Let's do an interview. I said, no. Hey, we want to put you in this magazine. It was yeah, great let's fight. relive no. your loss. Let's yeah, relive no. your failure. That and sounds fun. I, no, but I kept saying no, 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 no. And what I should have said was, okay, yes, let's do it. Let's get back on the horse. Let's put the shirt back on. So, so many times we, we lose and we fail and immediately we want to shrink back down and be quiet and not take the interviews or not, not get back on the horse, not get back into action. If without action, the weeds overtake the jungle or the weeds overtake the village. If the villagers aren't moving and staying, staying moving and continuing to move, if, they are, if that foot traffic isn't happening, the weeds will overtake the village. And that's what happened to me in my mind after, and that's why, where I was. I was in, I was being, you know, choked out by the weeds of self-doubt and the weeds of, of worry and the weeds of insecurity in that 688 day stretch because I didn't own my loss. I didn't put the shirt back on. So I lost that fight and I saw that shirt. I wanted to throw everything in me. I wanted to throw the fight shorts away. I wanted to throw the mouthpiece away. I wanted to throw the shirt away. I wanted to get rid of everything that reminded me of that pain, that failure, that anguish, that, that embarrassment. But instead, something in me said, no, you're going to put that shirt in the washing machine. You're going to wash it. You're going to throw it back on. And you're going to go freaking throw these weights around. You're going to go spar in it. You're going to go run in it. You're going to go do this. Why? Because that was an event. It wasn't the person. You need to be reminded of that loss because that loss is going to what's going to propel you to your setback, and it's going to be an inspiration for millions of people. And that's what we have to do as men. Don't let it go to your ego. Put the shirt back on and go. All right, Michael. Hey, this has been great, great stuff. If somebody wants to keep track of you, follow up and see what's going on in your life, how do they follow you? Um, I'm very active on Instagram mainly and Twitter at Mike Chandler MMA. Um, I love to do, you know, workout. I do try to do a workout of the day a couple couple days a week, whether it be a workout that I had just done or whether it be a live workout that I was doing or whether it be a workout from last week that I archived or maybe something from a year ago that people loved. And so I'm constantly putting, putting out movements. You know, uh, I do a lot of strength and conditioning. I'm probably one of the one of the uh, most active strength and conditioning fighters there are in the world, um, just because I think the more I can become a better athlete, the better. So um, at Mike Chandler MMA on all my social media channels, and uh, that's where I kind of do most of my talking and most of my platform. So, Dude, it's been an honor having you here. You've been, uh, you've been very helpful to a lot of people, especially me. Thank you. I'm the better for interaction. Thanks, brother. I appreciate you. Thank uh-huh, you. You too. Hey, thanks for listening. For more aggressive living, head over to bryantome.com. Get signed up for the mailing list to get regular shots of positive aggression sent straight to your inbox. And while you're there, you can also find articles, podcasts, and books. I'm also active on Instagram. Search Brian Tome. Special thanks to the band Judges for the music. Aggressive Life with Brian Tome is a production of Crossroads Church, Cincinnati, Ohio.